Welcome back, Tiger fans, to Rockin' Radio's football podcast. I'm Nate Edwards. That's Nathan Hurst. This is Before the Box Score. Welcome to February. Welcome to not spring ball. We're not talking even about, I guess we're talking about the Super Bowl, but we're not even talking about spring practice yet. That's how far away we are from things. But we are going to talk about the defense again. I know that was our show last time. And this is going to be our show this time. And you know what? It might even be the show next time. Who even knows? Uh, but uh, we are back. We're going to talk about all the offseason stuff that's happened, uh, some seniors showing out, some money coming in, and, of course, our new defensive staff. So, Nathan Hurst, how are you doing, sir? Doing great. They haven't they haven't kicked me out of Rock M yet. I'm no. two weeks in. Um, I'm still still fooling them, so we'll, we'll see how long that lasts. He's working his way into the walls, folks. Once you get in there, you can't get out. <laughs> like black mold. Man. So we did, last time I talked to you all, it was an emergency podcast with Quentin Corpio, and we talked about the hiring of Corey Batum. So we had my initial thoughts on it. We had Quentin's initial thoughts on it, but we haven't heard a peep from Nathan Hurst on what he thinks about Mr. Corey Batum. And of course, I did some research and posted some stories, and you can read that on rockingnation.com. But Nathan, I'm going to clear the way. This is your little pedestal. Go ahead and sit upon it. Tell me what you think about Corey Batum being Missouri's next defensive coordinator. Yeah, I th- I think it's a solid hire. Um, it was it's kind of one of those names that when you when you first read it and you you kind of have to ask who who is that, and then you do a little bit of at least an initial googling like oh oh yeah okay okay. Um, uh, so coming from South Alabama, that's somebody somebody or a program that we've kind of kept an eye on. I know you kept an eye on them in recent years. Uh, from their head coach and his uh, defensive success, um, he moved on to Alabama as their defensive coordinator. Um, so it's obviously something uh, where defenses and what they built that program on. So he's coming from a solid bloodline of of defense, um, and, and and more importantly, he passes the drink test, mm-hmm. meaning he uh, is experienced in calling plays, which is number one on all of his coordinator lists of hires, and two. He's coached with drink in the past, and uh, it seems like he he uh, almost entirely hires guys that he's already worked with. That isn't the case for the other guy we're going to talk about today. Um, but they uh, but he he does pass that uh, does pass that specific drink test. So I think we can give Drinkwitz the credit uh, from the hire, some of the hires he's made in the past that have that have worked out, uh, especially his most recent coordinator hires. So um, uh, not knowing a ton about Batoon before we heard his name. Uh, then learning a little bit more about him, I think it's a it's a it's a solid hire. It's not one that necessarily uh, would win the press conference, if you will, because he's not a name that was on a lot of guys, a lot of people's radars ahead of time. But once you once you kind of dig under the surface and and see the success he had at South, see the experience that he's had um, over 30 years. I mean, he's been coaching since I was in kindergarten, uh, and that's uh, pretty pretty impressive. He's seen, he's coached with a lot of other coaches, a coach with a lot of other head coaches, a lot of um, different styles, different parts of the country. He has SEC experience at Ole Miss, um, not as a defensive coordinator, but he does know what it's like to recruit in the SEC. He knows what it's mm-hmm. like, um, just that grind day in and day out. And the teams that he was on in the SEC were, <clears throat> at least for a short time, uh, pretty successful. He freeze, but they they were successful teams. Um, so he's he has experience winning in the SEC, uh, yeah. at least for a couple years there. So um, there are there are a couple big questions, you know, that that immediately pop out uh, about him. I mean, the first one we I mentioned it already, but the uh, you know at, at South Alabama they had a very good defense at South Alabama at least for the last couple of years. The big question is was that his defense? Was that Kane Womack's defense? Was it both of their defenses working together? That's one that you know it's I'm sure they're both going to give each other plenty of credit there. Um, so it's really hard to say for sure. And it's at, being outside the program, it's impossible to say. Um, so that's a big question. I will say that doing a little bit of digging into South Alabama message boards, they were almost entirely uh, sad to see him go. I mean, that was, they, they felt like it was a loss to that Batum was leaving, time. especially because they thought they were going to keep him. They thought they were going to keep him um, when Major Applewhite moved to the head coaching job there and, and, Applewhite said he was going to keep the tomb. So his plan was mm-hmm. to stay out South Alabama, despite the coaching change. So, I mean, you, you never know if you go to Mizzou message boards, you're going to read a lot of people that don't know what the hell are talking about myself included. So um, you never really know, but it's better. It's better than the other way. I'll say that I, I, I'd rather have 
them being sad he left than being happy that he left. Yeah, no, I agree. And before anybody any gets super judicious, uh, Drink and Batum missed each other by one year at Arkansas State. But he does like to pull from the Arkansas State. And he actually, he also really values high school experience. Like I went through, hold on, I got everybody in here somewhere. When you look at all the hires that he's had um, for his, for all of his position coaches, there's a couple of things that he values in high school. Coaching in high school is definitely one of them. Um, if you look back at all of his hires, um, when they, what, what kind of experience that they had, um, almost all of them have had some kind of high school experience. Maybe in one year, maybe it's two years. But, um, you know, Batum's got like three or four years, if I remember correctly. Uh, what did I say that he had? He had one, two, three years uh, of high school experience. And he also had JUCO experience, which, you know, the thing about high school and JUCO, which I think Eli Drinkwitz values because he did it, is that you have to be super creative because you don't have an abundance of resources. You got to be a really good teacher because you get these guys for a little bit and they're all various skill levels. Uh, and you got to be able to teach really well. You got to communicate really well. And you got to have good game day tactics because, like, you just you never know what you're going to get at that level. Um, and so I think he values that. He values that kind of experience with someone who's a good communicator, good teacher, and, and is used to working kind of at a, a – a weird, weird kind of talents uh, spread out, if you will, um, when you never know exactly what you're going to get. So he has that. He's got the Jugo experience. And, yeah, he's a good defensive coordinator. Um, I broke down his experience. Now, he's been a coordinator at a couple stops that I just, I'm just i just not going to count. Like, I don't think Hawaii is going to teach us anything. Like, I love the Rainbow Warriors. I think they're great. Not going to learn anything from that. Really not even going to learn anything from his time at Northern Arizona, which is a very mid-program while he was there. Uh, lots of ups and downs, and it's like it's Northern Arizona. I can't really get a good read on that, but we do know a couple things. Number one, to your point, he's got SEC experience. He was at Ole Miss. Uh, he was a recruiting coordinator at Ole Miss when they were cheating, uh, which is not cheating anymore. Just want to throw that out. Um, Hugh Freeze, pioneer, uh, is what I'm saying here. You heard it here first, folks. But like he he was uh, in the recruiting building for their massive cheating scandal. Uh, some people take offense to that. I personally do not. Uh, it just is yeah, he, he, big never wrong, just early. He wasn't yeah. wrong. He was just early. <laughs> there you go. They, I mean, every coach out there is trying to find some kind of schematic advantage to win football games, and they're probably cheating. They're all probably cheating. And I, you know, whatever your moral stance on that is fine. For me, I land on if if you're trying the hardest you can to get good players and win games. I'm all about that boss. So, you know, don't, don't look to me for your moral compass when it comes to college football, at least in that aspect. So we know he's got SEC experience. We know he has knows how to cheat when it comes to recruiting, whatever that means now, I don't know. Um, and then he's also got, you know, some ex coordinator experience. Now the thing about South Alabama and yes, Kane Womack, you know, Corey Batum, they're going to, you know, Hey, every, it was a team effort or like coach Womack was great. Coach Batum was great. Whatever, whatever. The interesting thing is that they improved that team immediately and dramatically, both on the offensive and defensive side, but certainly the defensive side. South Al has been kind of this defensive stalwart in the Sun Belt right along there with Troy for the three years that they were there. Um, now, the weird thing is that, you know, you got to point this out, the South Alabama defense regressed last year despite having, like, the fifth most returning production on defense. Now, you can point to, you know, the offense fell apart, which means, you know, the defense has to try harder and when you put stress on a defense, eventually they're going to break. But it was simple stuff, things that they were good at. The passing defense stunk despite the fact that they returned most of their secondary. They were terrible in the red zone. They gave up big plays for touchdowns. They couldn't hold teams to field goals. And so, you know, that's not what you want to see at the last stop before he comes to Mizzou. Um, but, you know, just like with everything, you don't know how this is going to play out. You've got coaches who just rip it for five years. Think of like uh, Justin Fuente at Memphis. Goes to Virginia Tech. <laughs> just tanks it, right? You think of, oh, gosh, you know, Billy Napier, same thing in Louisiana, got him on the up and up, goes into Florida, on the down and down. Uh, so, like, you just never know. And, of course, Gary Pinkle was not the uh, most favorite hire uh, in the Mizzou world. I mean, by the way, he's a Hall of Fame coach, and he's probably going to get a statue made of him someday. So, you know, you just never know. Um, I guess for you, you know, we, we talked about Corey Batum running a 3-3-5, or what it looked like a 3-3-5, three, three, three defensive linemen, Three linebackers, five defensive backs. Obviously, Missouri runs with a five defensive back scheme. Most defenses do nowadays. It's the modern defense. 
What do you think about a potential move to three defensive linemen, three linebackers? I don't think it's going to happen, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i kind of anti – have a general anti-335, mainly it's probably more – uh, looking down my nose as it at it, <laughs> being uh, arrogant as a power five program. It seems to be it's a it's a system that a lot of times uh, G five programs will run, or maybe lower tier power fives that don't have the defensive line talent to fill up four spots. Um, and, it, and it's kind of a weird gimmick, kind of be gimmicky in a way where you can uh, confuse your opponents. And a, a lot of times it's used as a, as a way to, to even the field if you're playing a talent dis- mismatch. Now. You know, at Mizzou, are we often playing in a talent a mismatch against other SEC teams? Yeah, um, but I think we also uh, have the ability to attract, and we currently have four defensive linemen at plus that can fill out a, a, a full four-man defensive line. So that said, I, I'm I wouldn't say I would be against running it as a you know something to go to, um, you know, here and there. I mean, any good defensive coordinator is going to uh, be multiple and be able to do lots of different things. Uh, depending on the depending on the team that you're playing, depending on the situation, the down, the distance, your own personnel. Maybe uh, we have a third linebacker that steps up and uh, ha- makes it impossible to take him off the field this year. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to be the case, but maybe that happens. Um, or maybe we have injuries uh, on the you know, God forbid along the defensive line, and we have to be creative. And three three five is a way to be creative. Um, so it, I, I'm not saying I would never want to see him as you run a three, three, five, but as like a base defense, I, I would say I'd prefer <laughs> personally prefer yeah. to, to stay away from it. Um, yeah. I, but that said, I know it has given Mizzou quite a difficult time in multiple matchups we played, uh, especially in, in bowl games in recent years, uh, against yeah. teams we may have been more talented than, um, some, some, uh, armed forces teams, uh, of note, uh, have screwed us pretty, pretty good with it. Um, so it can work, uh, but if it's a you know in the SEC when you're dissected, ev- you know every single t- t- tendency that you have can be dissected. I think it's easier to uh, easier to easier to beat if a coach if coaching staffs are preparing for it all season long. Yeah, I mean Rocky Lawn in New Mexico ran a three three five in two thousand six. That was the Helen and Hank basket game. Uh, Brady Hoke ran a three three five at San Diego State in two thousand ten when we needed the No Miracle to be a very good, but still G5 San Diego state team. Um, it's funky. It's tough. It puts a lot of speed on the field and it brings pressure from all sorts of different angles. That's really hard to pick up. Obviously throws your offensive linemen, uh, throws their protections kind of out of whack. You know, they're not used to seeing that sort of thing and they can't really anticipate where you're coming from. So yeah, it's an underdog tactic that works very well. I don't think we're going to run it. I mean, we just had a kind of an exodus of linebackers <laughs> uh, right now. Uh, again, the, the portal opens up, excuse me, after spring practice. So like this can change. Um, but you have one, two, three linebackers who have actual playing experience in the SEC. You have one, two, three, four guys past them. One is a special teams ace. The other ones are various flavors of freshmen. Um, I don't think you want to put stress on those linebackers to learn a new scheme and then be deployed on the field constantly. Um, also, by the way, you just happen to have 10 great defensive linemen on the edge. One of which is a, you know, top 10 prospect in the country, like who, who is a, is a four man defensive edge rusher. Like, I don't think you want to do that. So, uh, and maybe, you know, you're like, Oh, well you can put him as a, you know, one of the outside linebackers that rushes Well, they're all pretty heavy. So I, I just, I don't see it. And yeah, you, it would, in addition with who he hired for his edge coach, but we'll get to that in a second. Go ahead. Edge coach. Um, which also it would really, I think it would hurt recruiting. I mean, we just, yeah. We, we were doing great on the recruiting trails. We just brought in the top defensive end or one of the top defensive ends in the country. Um, and if all of a sudden you're telling him uh, you're not going to play defensive end or edge anymore, you're going to be playing either outside linebacker, which I'm not sure he's really suited for in terms of the pass coverage uh, uh, and even some of the run stopping things that it would require. Um, and he's not big enough or and he probably wouldn't want to get big enough to move to be one of the, you know, be the defensive tackle there. So um yeah, I, it would be very difficult to switch recruiting gears on, along the defensive line, and honestly, on the, among your linebackers as well, because it's a different. Other than your middle linebacker, it's just going to be a different, um, different style and flavor of linebacker that that you're trying to bring in to really fit that system. And it can work if you have the personnel for it, or if you don't have the personnel for a four-two-five. But we've recruited yeah. for the last four years for a four-two-five, um, and it's worked well for us, and it works well 
um, it works well in the SEC, at least how it's currently constructed. So it wouldn't make any sense to completely shift shift gears there. Now, I mentioned in the piece that, you know, the last time Missouri saw a 3-3-5, Steve Wilkes was running Mekhi Wingo into the line from five yards back uh, in 2021. Um, someone mentioned in the comments that actually the last time we did it was this year, 2023, uh, where we ran a three-man front. So I went back and watched, and I think technically, yes, there were some instances in which they ran kind of a three-man front, but it was a three-man odd front with, like, the outside linebacker standing up on the edge. And a lot of times they would put uh, Miles Gaddy out there into that spot. So, eh, again, defense is nebulous, man. It's not like, oh, here's your slot receiver, and he can line up here and here. Here's your X receiver. Here. Like, you just kind of plug players in places and, and, and let them do their thing. So it's really tough to read an alignment, especially on the field, unless you know the personnel really well and you know the plays that are being called. So who I don't remember who that commenter was. Tip of the cap. Thanks for letting me know. I think technically you're right. But I think for the most part, it was still kind of a more of a more of your typical four two five with just like an extra wrinkle to it, maybe like an outside wrinkle to it. So, point is, I don't think he's going to run it. Uh, he came in. I don't think they hired uh, Eli Drink was hired Corey Batoon because he had some sterling record. I don't think it was because he kept putting out elite defense. Is what she put out good ones. I think really at the core is that Corey Batoon wants to create havoc any way that he can. And at South Alabama, he did it with a 3-3-5. And I think he's just got the right mindset, and he's been calling plays with that in mind. And I think Eli Drinkwitz has realized this is Missouri's identity. Be aggressive on defense, create havoc. From that standpoint, Mr. Hurst, we talked about the different defensive coordinators that we've had, the straight man, the zone, the havoc. Are you endorsing uh, a havoc, havoc-friendly havoc defense for at least another two years um, under what we're recruiting with Eli Drinkwitz? Yeah, I definitely am, especially uh, with the jump that I expect the offense to take this year um, in terms of ball control, explosive plays. Uh, the Havoc, Havoc defense is great um, to force turnovers, but it also gives up a lot of big plays too. So um, that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be shutting teams out, um, but, it, but it can flip fields really fast. It can create momentum really fast. Um, and when you don't have the type of, of uh, depth on defense like a Georgia has where they can just sit on you all game long. Um, and they don't, they're not really worried about creating havoc because they know that they're just going to suffocate you over, over three downs and then get off the field. Um, we don't, we don't have that depth. We have some of the top end, you know, a few top end guys that, that, uh, that can, that could do that, but not 11 men or even 15, the 15 to 17 that you would need uh, to feel the feel the defense that could do that. So the other option is, let them, you know, be a bend but don't break defense. That lets them slowly drain the life out of you all the way down the field, mm-hmm. uh, and then hope you get a stop in the, on the forty, uh, and or hope they miss a field goal or something. Uh, but then your your the time of possessions way off. Your your offense, which is the best part of your field, isn't on the best part of your team isn't on the field as much. Uh, and that's who we want on the field. We don't want the defense on the field. We want the offense on the field. So if that means uh, going for broke and you give up a couple long plays. Uh, and a couple scores, that's fine because it gets it gets uh, Brady and Luther and the boys back out there. Yeah. Now, you mentioned turnovers, and that's actually mm-hmm. been, other than big plays given up, that's kind of been a bugaboo with Blake Baker's defense is that they didn't really force a ton of turnovers. You didn't see a lot of interceptions. You saw forced fumbles, but they really w- weren't very lucky at recovering them all the time. It was, it was much lower than what uh, the national averages were. Now, they still created turnovers, and they had pretty good luck as far as, like, Hey, we can create a lot. They just didn't recover a lot. Um, and Corey Batoon's guys, you know, for whatever this is worth, we're pretty good with the turnover luck. They they create a lot of opportunities and then capitalize on those, on those opportunities, and we're able to turn the teams over, which is a skill that you absolutely need and one that is not reliable at all. It's called turnover luck for a reason. If it, it fluctuates, you know, year to year. Ask 2000, 2008 Buffalo and see if their turnover luck is good. Where's Buffalo now? Yeah, still scuffling at the bottom of the back. That's what I thought, right? So it's it's not consistent, but at least from that standpoint, it seems like maybe, and this obviously could change, but maybe Corey Batoon has got the secret sauce or a style of play uh, to maybe create some more turnovers, even if those aren't consistent. Uh, I don't... Don't bank on that, Mr. Hurst. But I mean, what do we need? What like plus one point two, plus one point three, just something more, right? That's all we need right. from a turnover standpoint. And turnovers are a, 
they're a positive side effect of creating havoc, right? You're not creating yeah. havoc to create turnovers. You're creating havoc uh, to to get in their head, uh, to uh, and I mean ultimately to get stops, right? But uh, maybe you get a big sack that sets them behind the behind the sticks a bit. Um, so if, if you get a turnover, that's awesome. That's amazing. Um, and maybe it's because you got a big sack, a strip fumble, or a tip ball that uh, that a linebacker comes up with. Uh, but really, that's more of a side effect. That's not what you're you're not running a defense to get turnovers. Uh, if you are, you're probably not doing a great job at, at actually doing the job of a defense. But you're running a defense to get stops however you can. Havoc is a way to get stops, and a way to get stops is also to to jump on a, a loose ball every once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. So we hired Gordon Patoon, and in my eyes, I think we're sharing the same vision here, that, that it's because of his philosophy. And however he wants to run that philosophy – you know, he's going to do it. But I think it is going to be with the four-man front and two linebackers and five defense backs. And the reason that I really, really think that is because of the most recent hire, uh, which is former Houston defensive line coach, now current Missouri Edge defensive line coach, Brian Early. Now, this is another older guy. Uh, usually in the past, Eli Drinkwitz is skewed young, right? Really good recruiters, a lot of young guys. Uh, had one of the most uh, numerous black guys on his staff. Um, which, you know, that is that speaks volumes, especially in Missouri. You don't you usually don't see that. You just see a bunch of white dudes on the staff. And he was really embracing the DEI side um, and touching into giving younger black men uh, a chance to coach. Now, he is skewed a little bit older. Now, obviously, Corey Batoon is a native Hawaiian. He's 55. He's now the elder statesman on the staff. And then Brian Early, well, you know, much like you mentioned, you know, Corey Batoon has been coaching since you were in kindergarten. Um, Brian Early is right there. He got his coaching career, I believe, started in like 1994, 1995. So he's been doing this for a while. This is another guy with extensive high school experience. In fact, most of his experience is at the high school ranks. Um, and he's also stayed in the state of Arkansas. Um, when I, I, my, I have a piece that's coming out later this week, uh, so I'll spoil it a little bit. Um, but really, I mean, if you, if you count Monticello, Arkansas as his home base, he has not worked more than 300 miles away from there except for like three years in his entire career. He is very centric to Arkansas. And this is going to be the third job that he's had that takes him further away uh, from Monticello of all places. But the things that actually matter is that he has put guys in the NFL, he's got all conference performers, and he likes his defensive linemen to be active. Tackles for loss, sacks, passes defense. If you read his bio, it talks about how many records he broke at Arkansas State for sack records, or even at Houston, and and you know again, if you're talking havoc, Nathan Hurst, this is the guy that you want to hire as an edge defensive line coach. Yeah, I, I, it's about as solid a, a, a hire as I think we can hope for for in terms of his uh, experience, his productivity. Um, I mean, he's put he had just in the last I think four or five however long he was at Houston, four or five years, seven All Conference players at Houston on the defensive line. That includes two this year in in the Big Twelve. Uh, he had a first team all all Big 12 player and a second team all Big 12 player this past year just, uh, only at at Houston. So that's a pretty good start for Houston in the in a new conference. Uh, and he's also got six guys into the NFL too. And and that's a pretty big deal for a coach whose best job was at Houston. Um, and Houston ha- can put talent into the NFL, but um, not. I mean, not not. It's not just every year that yeah, they're, not they're regularly putting guys. And so he's yeah. got four guys four guys drafted. Two guys uh, that assigned uh, free as free agents out of the draft. So, um, I, I mean, I think that's pretty impressive, and that's what that's what you're looking for for a defensive line coach. Which but you're coaching, especially when you're break it down to coaching the edge, you're coaching what, six or seven players to mm-hmm. do one very specific thing. So, you're, I mean, that that's a skill set to teach that, and you want someone that's a good teacher of that. But he's all he's he's going to be a recruiter. I mean, that's going to be seventy percent of his job is be be a, a character guy, be a, be a locker room guy, be a recruiter. On top of, of course, teaching teaching his players how to you know wreck shop um, as much as possible, um, but it, it seems like he's got experience doing that, bringing guys in, get, moving them along, producing them, getting them getting them paid uh, at the other end of it. So I, 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 that's about as good as we could hope. I mean, we're not going to hire Ed Orgeron to be our defensive line coach. <laughs> no. So, uh, or I mean, I, I'm trying to think of just a what, who's a big name defensive line coach that we're, we could bring in. There's Ray really not Kulagowski. one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, other him. So, I mean, yeah, he, he, his, his big question is, um, 
I mean, can he recruit, which we, th- we know he can recruit. And is he going to not get in fights with our players? And that's going to be another big thing. But if you can do those two things, he's going to do a great job here. I think that's, I think that's the, that'll be money. Man, he rockets to the top of the power list as far as coaches that I do not want to fight. Like, uh, I, no, I, my gosh. I, if you have not seen a picture of him, you pull over to the side of the road if you're driving or pull it up on your car. This dude is a jacked, bald guy, which is like the last thing you want to F with at any point in your life. He has like almost no neck. He is bald. He's got like one of those like veins that sticks out of the top. I'm just like, you You should be a strength coach, man. He's, yeah, well, that's what my first thought is. This is a strength coach, and there's no way he's been in less than five bar fights that he has won all of. So oh, I, yeah. I, uh, he's, yeah, he's a, he's a guy that is going to command respect, I think from day one, just by his physical appearance. I mean, his first tweet as a Mizzou coach was chastising the planet fitness gym for not being open at the time that he wanted to be there. <laughs> I mean, this is, yeah. this is a meathead strength coach. Go get after <laughs> the quarterback football coach. Like this is, this is the guy that you want to do this job. Uh, That's what we want. Yeah, that's what we want. Yeah, you mentioned the recruiting piece. Um, he's also got a pretty extensive network in the JUCOs. Um, I know that he pulled a lot into Houston um, and had a couple of JUCO guys, you know, become all conference and, and get some undrafted uh, free agent uh, contracts. He also coached uh, Javon Roland Jones, which if you all don't recognize that name, that's fine. He's kind of more of an obscure NCAA factoid, but he is the number two sack leader in NCAA history. 43 and a half sacks in four years at Arkansas State. And Coach really coached him the entire time. Now, that's one of your undrafted free agents who signed with Cincinnati. Um, but that dude was productive. Now, you can say, okay, hey, look, on his NFL draft picks, you know, he didn't coach any of them for the entire four years. That's fine. That's just kind of the nature of the, of the sport right now. Um, was it the individual talent? Was it him? Did he you know, bring in the talent or did he grow the talent? I'm just, I don't care. At this point, he's done nothing wrong. We'll figure it out later. What Any kind of hire, whether it's in football or in life, you just you look at the resume, you look at the achievements, you talk to the person, and you see if it feels right for you. And Eli Drink must talk to this guy. It felt right for him. It felt right for Corey Batoon. And again, the resume ain't too bad. You know, getting uh, six guys in the NFL from, you know, Houston. <laughs> well, Houston and Arkansas State, like, Mm-hmm. not renowned powerhouses of NFL talent, and he had defensive ends get in there. I am satisfied, and I'm satisfied because we've not seen him play it down yet, but, like, man, can you imagine what he's going to do with Williams Winery or, like, you know, Johnny <laughs> Walker Jr., who's on the cusp of the NFL? Man, I can't I can't wait. Yeah, it should be fun. And uh, he did not coach with Drinkwitz, but they missed each other by one year at Arkansas State. Uh, Drinkwitz left at 2013. He, like, he got there in 2014. But I know they they had to have run into each other because he was the defensive coordinator at Fayetteville High for yeah. several years while Drinkwitz was at Arkansas State. So you know they were recruit they were they were talk they were in talking with each other in, in recruiting you know recruiting folks. He was at Arkansas as a I think just as a general staffer, not a coach, uh, for a year in that in that stint as well. So they definitely have run into each other in the past. Yeah. Um, and so I, I feel like it was, it, was, it seemed, and Drinkwitz kind of made it sound like it seemed like it was an obvious, an obvious move at, at this point to, to bring him in. He said, yeah. he, he said he had had, had uh, early on his radar for a while. Um, and kind of, you know, obviously didn't need, had an opening until, until now, but, um, sounds like it's a, it was, it was one of his first calls, which going back to Batoon, I, I'm not sure if Batoon was his first or second call, um, or maybe even third, it's impossible to say, but I think he landed out on a solid call. It sounds like early might've been, been one of those top, top choices that he had. Yeah. I mean, and you know, he probably came highly recommended. He was on the Houston staff with uh, Brandon Jones, who was our current offensive line coach. You know, they, they coached together uh, from 2019 to 2022. So like they were very used to having their charges go at each other in practice. And like, to your point, you know, early was at Fayetteville high school from 2009 to 12. Al Davis was a volunteer coach at Fayetteville in 13, so they just missed each other there. He then missed Al Davis again at Arkansas when he was a quality control of 13, and then Al Davis was there 14 to 16. Uh, but then, of course, he was at Arkansas State, just like everybody else in this staff seems at one point to be in Arkansas State. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's interesting. Now, you, you mentioned the, uh, the first call, and, of course, the rule of college football is that you always get the first guy that you want. You never talk about the ones that turned you down. Um, I had a friend of mine, uh, Tyson Moore, shout out Tyson. 
he messaged me and he said, do you find it weird that DJ Durkin's name was floated out during this coaching search when a normally you don't hear any names being floated out by Eli Drinkwitz during his search and B it was met with such seemingly resounding negativity that, you know, X amount of days later, then we hear Corey Batoon. I guess the question I'm asking you, Hurst, is number one, do you think DJ Durkin was a, a realistic or an actual hire? And number two, do you think he floated it out because somebody either drank or the administration was like, we're not, we're not really super sure on this one. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, 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 yeah at first question, yes, I do think he was a very uh, legitimate candidate. Um, I don't have any insider information, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if it went as far as actually making an offer to him in some capacity. Now, whether it was, you know, it just, they didn't come to terms or because the name was floated out uh, to get a gauge, a, a gauge. I, I don't know. I, I do know if they really had to have him, I think they would have gotten him. They had, we had the, had the money, have the money to, um, uh, to pay. Uh, so whether they just didn't feel like it was worth the trouble for the amount of money that he wanted um, maybe, and I, I mean, I, we know that his name was floated out, but we don't really know how that happened. I, um, I had heard that he was in town, uh, in Columbia, uh, for interviews, but th- did that mean someone saw him at, uh, CC Broiler Steakhouse and uh, say, Oh, DJ Durkin's here. They, they've got it. He's got to be interviewed for the job. Or does that, does that mean that, you know, Drinkwitz called uh, a buddy who called a buddy who dropped a note in his sister's mailbox and, you know, that's how it got out. It, it's, uh, you know, impossible to say at this point. Yeah, well, I'm I will say I'm glad. Him. I'm glad he's not. I'm glad. I'm glad we uh, we went a different direction. I will. I will yeah. say that. Not a good dude. Um, I don't know a quick way of saying this, but uh, DJ Durkin was the coach at Maryland for three or four years. Uh, during one of his practices, a player died during spring conditioning. Uh, during a one of those, if you've been in the East Coast, kind of the DMV sector in Maryland, eighty-one degrees with like an thousand percent humidity it was one of those practices um and the training staff uh working with a, a coach named uh, rich Oat, um was a very aggressive in disciplining their players uh food shaming fat shaming uh they would tell players to lose weight and then give them like 18 candy bars to eat they would tell them to you know cut weight um they would knock food out of their hands they would play horror movies during breakfast and lunch to scare them and say this is the aggressive behavior you need and, you know, the, the, the line that killed DJ Durkin and killed Jordan McNair uh, during his press conference, he said, he makes, makes us all honest and he makes, makes weaknesses of all of us. And his job was to make them tough and endure the heat. So when someone was struggling during wind sprints during intense heat, they just chastised him and made him keep going. Um, and now DJ Durkin says, you know, I didn't, I had no idea what's happening. In which case you say, number one, okay, that means you hired a guy who you claimed shares a vision with you. And then that vision included, uh, uh, you know, basically using food and exercise to discipline uh, players beyond what's what's reasonable and normal that involves someone dying. So either that is your vision, in which case you should not be a college football coach or you didn't know that was happening, in which case you were hired to know that that's happening and you should not be in charge of players at that level as a college football coach. It's just it's not a good thing. And he's at Auburn and I don't know, you know, just. Just a, just a great collection of great dudes there down on the plains. Um, but I am very glad that he's at nah, he's not at Mizzou, and that we have yeah. guys that we do. He and Hugh deserve each other, so you know, may, well, well, we will see them uh, here in Columbia in we about will. six months from now. Um, and so we'll 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 see how that how that works out. Um, I, I'd rather him be on the other sideline, to be honest. And beyond beyond the, the beyond the drama and the you know the neg- the the toxic culture that he created in Maryland, he's not that great of a defensive coordinator he, he, yeah. <laughs> in his stops. He's, he's never been ter- bad. He's never been bad, but he's not a, a program changing coach to make it worth overlooking all the other baggage that he has. Yeah. yeah. He doesn't do anything novel or unique and he's not particularly good if he's doesn't have an incredible talent advantage. So yeah, I don't, I don't see the appeal, but I'm also not a college football coach. So what do I know? Uh, but hey, let's get to some good stuff. Uh, I don't know if you all saw this, but uh, you know, during the the Senior Bowls, all the various ones that are, that are out there, we had some Missouri players balling out. Specifically, Darius Robinson, Nathan Hurst. I I don't know if this is, I I don't know if it's true or not, but it seems like Darius Robinson, by coming back to Mizzou this past year and then walking the circuit through these Senior Bowls, 
has worked himself from like a day two, like a third or fourth round pick. Surefire first round at worst second round. Like this is incredible. We all knew he was good. Did you did you anticipate first round talk about Darius Robinson at this point in our in our in the season? I, I definitely didn't. I mean, I, I knew I knew he was good. We all knew he was good. Um, I mean, I would have probably guessed a, a month ago. I would have said, "Oh yeah, he'll he'll be a sure fire late second round, mid late second round pick." He'll uh, his people uh, scouts will start seeing him on film, see how um, how diverse his skill set is, all the different things he can play. He can play inside and play outside. He has production doing both. Um, so I, I knew he was good. Kirby Str- Smart tried to tell everyone he was good. I mean, that was the one guy. Uh, that he was raving about after after we played Georgia this past year, how he was unblockable. Um, and, and I think his measurables, he's a huge dude, as he is. Um, I think it's going to make scouts. Tr- and um, I think once he gets to the combine, he's only going to make, it's only going to be better because that's when the scouts are going to get in the room. GMs are going to get in the room with him. And beyond all of his, his physical uh, uh, prowess, his strength, his size. He's like a top flight character, dude. Uh, all accounts are he's a, an amazing locker room presence. He um, is uh, a leader in the community and in the locker room. And I think that's going to mm-hmm. easily come out in those interviews. Uh, so if, if anyone's on the fence about as far as being a first round router, once they get into a room with him, I think that's going to be game over. And uh, at this point, I think he's got to be pretty close to a lock, barring knock on wood, something weird happening, you know, at a, sure. at a pro day or something. Sure. Yeah. I have not talked to many players, uh, but the ones I've talked to, Darius Robinson always stood out to me. Uh, he was one that never seemed like he minded uh, taking questions or talking to the media. Uh, not not that there were players who were like, you know, oh, screw you. Why are you talking to me? Just, you know, you, I mean, 18 people stick a, a microphone in your face like you're going to have a reaction to it. And Darius Robinson never seemed to be bothered by it. He always seemed to kind of embrace the opportunity to share his thoughts and, and, and enjoy that. And I know I've, I've read, you know, beat reporters, uh, you know, Gerard Hamilton, uh, the dudes from uh, Post Dispatch, they have all raved about, you know, being a good dude to talk to. And like, he'll come up and be, you know, talk to you just because even if you don't have to, like he'll, he'll do that. So I do think he's a very charming personality. He's, he's great to talk to, but he's not going to give away the farm. He's not going to tell you all the secrets, but like, he's just a, an enjoyable guy to have a conversation with. And, you know, that can be a rarity uh, among athletes. So if you get him in a room during the combine, yeah, I think during the interview process, he'll do very well. Uh, let alone the fact that he can blow you up on the inside or the outside as a defensive lineman. Uh, I'd had his best season from a production standpoint this past season. So, yeah, I, I'm with you. We knew he was good. Didn't realize that NFL teams would like him that much. But, uh, you know, this is in a, in, a, in a a sport where you do need to jump at the first real opportunity that you get. Like, even if you're like second, third round, you should probably take this. Uh, this is one of those instances where it actually paid off for him to come back. I would not say that would work out for everybody. I'm not saying, hey, just because you come back, you're going to do better. Um, I can think of a couple of quarterbacks where that did not work for them. But it is it is a, just a good story to hear that he came back, made a big impact with a great team, and kind of capitalized it with 11-2 season. And, man, if he becomes Missouri's next first-round NFL draft pick, that's just that's the coolest story in the world, man. Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, the fact that he did come back is the only reason – it's the only reason that he's in these conversations because – as a interior only defensive lineman, which is what he showed his whole career up until this year, he was good, you know, but he was n- not going to be somebody that is going to blow you away outside of a third, fourth round draft pick. But to show that you can move him to the outside, he can succeed there, w- succeed there really well. Um, but then you can move him around all over the line. He can go back in the line and be a good run stopper. He can go in line and get pressure in, uh, from the interior whenever you need to, if a, if, a, if a creative defensive coordinator wants to be fun with him, I'm just thinking of another guy that plays for the Kansas city chiefs, Chris Jones, <laughs> that does the exact same thing yep. with a very creative play caller. Yep. Um, and uh, if, if you get comps like that thrown around, um, you're going to go, you're going to go really fast, really soon. Cause everyone can use that guy uh, mm-hmm. to just to, to mess things up. Uh, and Chris Jones very well may not be on the chiefs next year. He's a free agent. And the yep. Chiefs are drip picking at the end of the first round, and uh, Darius Robinson might be there at the end of the first round. Yep. We can all uh, we can all hope. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, for, for Darius's sake, I hope he goes even sooner than that. But if yep. he's still sticking around, he's still. And I know the Chiefs uh, have other other needs as well. But uh, who who's 
who's to say a replacement for Chris Jones wouldn't be a pretty sweet yeah. gig. That'd be pretty cool. And then hang out with Nick Bolton uh, for Ooh. a couple of years. Man, that's Nick just, Bolton, that would be awesome. That suck at KU, Kansas City Chiefs fans. Just rolling the Mizzou-ness. But he's, Darius Robinson is not the only one, man. I mean, Ennis Raystraw, who again battled an injury all year, is also getting projected into the first round. Javon Foster, starting left tackle, has had rave reviews. He got beat by Terrius Robinson in one of the drills uh, at the Senior Bowl, which was very sad for Mizzou on Mizzou crime. Um, but, you know, Chris Abrams Drain had a couple standout moments in his bowl game as well. I mean, I'm not saying who would have thumped that Missouri players are good, but certainly, you know, that group right there, um, even with an injured Ennis Raystraw, like the, the number of first round, ch- you know, chatter and like, oh, these guys surprised or these guys were kind of the crown jewel. Like, it's, I mean, we're not, we're the fans, but like, it's great for us to hear. And it's even better for those players who stuck around and came back and, and went out on top. Cause like, this is, this is the sort of thing that you're hoping that last season turns into. Absolutely. You didn't even mention Cody Schrader had one of the filthiest Cody Schrader, juke yeah. moves that I have ever seen. And that got, that blew up on Twitter all by itself. Um, now I'm not saying that that's going to throw him uh, into a, a, a day two draft pick, um, but it certainly has had people remembering him and remembering what he did at senior day. Uh, so that when it comes down to the fourth, fifth, sixth rounds, um, or even as an undrafted free agent, uh, I, he's going to get, he's going to get some looks for sure. I mean, Rake Straw moved up is moving up draft boards and he hasn't stepped foot on a field since, uh, like a bef- couple weeks before the con- combo. Right. But mm-hmm. I think that's, that's a, uh, a byproduct of scouts finally having time to sit down and coaches sit down and watch the tape, mm-hmm. um, watch because and in doing that, that's going to help Abrams drain too. Cause he, he played really well. And I, I think a lot of Mizzou fans would say Amos drain uh, was the star of that secondary, but the reason he had so much production is because quarterbacks just did not throw Rake Straw's way. And that's what coaches and scouts are seeing on the film. Now is that Rake Straw would take up, take a guy. He would lock down that guy. That guy would not see, would not see the ball. Um, we saw that, you know, in a, a couple instances throughout the, uh, where he'd locked down the top, top guy, South Carolina, Xavier Leggett did nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think a big part of that was, was Rake Straw just kind of telling him that he, he wasn't going to have a day that day. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's what we, we saw that we saw it in, uh, against Georgia, um, locked down, uh, locked down, uh, old, old Dom there a little bit, uh, didn't let him have much of a day as either. Um, so it, uh, it, it, it's, I'm glad, I'm glad for his sake. We knew he was good. Uh, and now everyone else is, is learning about it. Yeah. albeit after the fact. Yeah. But Hey man. Wherever it comes, that's fine. For Cody Schrader, it, you, you, I think you nailed it with the moment, right? Oh, I'm going to remember that because I don't, I don't think anyone's going to look at Cody Schrader, the person, the career, or the combine stats and go, "Boy, this is a guy we got to get." But you look at the games, and you look at his, you know, his interview, his work ethic. Like no one's gonna work harder than than Cody Schrader. He just needs to be given a chance. And I'm not saying, you know, oh, he signs one undrafted free agent contract and bam, he's starting running back for, you know, I don't know, the Broncos or something like that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying he's got the ability to impress people, to get something, and then that work ethic is going to take him some way. I don't know how far. But it's going to get him an NFL check if someone gives him a chance. Um, now, would I love to see him as a starter in the NFL? Hell yes. How awesome would that be? Uh, I, I don't think it's likely. But then again, that's what Cody Schrader's story is all about, not thinking that's likely and him doing it anyway. So is, if that moment if that moment makes a GM go, yeah, I'll take a chance on this guy. That, that's all he really needs. And uh, for his sake, I hope he gets it because I just, I just want to see what happens. I want to see what happens when he makes yeah. an NFL roster, man. There are way weirder stories uh, of, of NFL players having long careers than the guy than the story of the guy who finished eighth in the Heisman voting, uh, going on to having a long NFL career. Up and down NFL rosters, there are guys from D two schools, from G five schools, uh, guys you've never heard of before, and all of a sudden, wow, this guy is starting for an NFL team, and in, in some cases, an NFL playoff team. Um, so it's it's it could happen. I mean, is it? Likely, am I going to put uh, put money on it? Probably not, but it would be really, really cool. Yeah, it would be cool. Speaking of putting money on it, <clears throat> Missouri had a little bit of a windfall 
uh, they went to the community chest and uh, a bank error in their favor. No, I'm kidding. A very, <laughs> very, very generous uh, donor who had $62 million laying around in the couch cushions and uh, wanted to send it Mizzou's way uh, was announced yesterday. Uh, today is Tuesday the 6th, so this was Monday the 5th. $62 million. Just <clears throat> Don't want to tell anybody who I am, which I get. If I had $62 million laying around, I don't want you to know I have that laying around. Oh, I don't have it laying around anymore. You get the point. Um, anonymous donor, $50 million of it earmarked for various construction projects. Uh, the other $12 million going to that elusive fund that, you know, just hangs out for Mizzou sports. Um, number one, Nathan, I know you're doing investigative journalism. You're putting on your... Uh, your lawyer hat, your accounting hat, and your, your journalism hat, all at once, a three-hat approach, trying to figure out what this all means. Tell us a little bit about what you've discovered so far as far as money and funds that this is going to. So uh, you mentioned the, the stadium renovations. That's what the biggest chunk's going to. We, uh, we know that. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, going to make the stadium bigger, nicer, shinier, maybe double-decker P-troughs. I think that would be pretty sweet. Um, maybe not. I don't know. Uh, but the, the 12 million that's going to the, the tiger fund, that is a little more nebulous. Um, and, and really all, it all comes back to, if you'll remember, I take you back in time to August, the Missouri state legislature passed a really nice little bill that changed the laws in Missouri, uh, to allow universities, uh, to directly have involvement with NIL, with the uh, with their athletes and the NIL contracts that they that they sign. Now, does that mean that schools can pay them cash in NIL? No, that's not what that means. But it means that they can help facilitate. Oh, here's a car dealership that they really and really wants player A to come sign autographs of the car dealership, uh, and now the car dealership doesn't have to find the player's agent or family member and set that up. They can go to the school and say, Hey, I'm looking for two football players uh, that are big and handsome and strapping and can they come and uh and and uh you know shake babies and kiss hands and all that fun stuff uh and i'll give them here's my here's my 10 grand that i'm going to drop down for that and the school can say yes we've got just the guy for you let me you know uh, show you uh, mr a and mr b they're going to roll down so creating that kind of facilitation is is really important this 12 million dollars is going to go to facilitate that now what does that mean no one really knows. It's not that Mizzou is not super um, transparent about exactly what this looks like. But the, here, I'll tell you what what the Tiger Fund does. So um, the Tiger Fund is split up among every program along in in at Mizzou. So if you wanted to donate money to the Tiger Fund for the gymnastics team, you could do that. You could donate specifically to the baseball team, to the wrestling team, to the football team. I'm going to go ahead and assume this twelve million dollars is mainly going to the football team. Um, they didn't say specifically, uh, but that kind of is, you know, the writing on the wall there. Um, but it, it goes for the areas of travel, equipment, educational opportunities and programming, marketing programs, mental wellness support, and mental performance coaching. So if you're supporting the Tiger Fund, you're supporting one or more of those different areas, where whatever you feel led to support. So maybe you're very concerned about um, mental wellness support for the athletes. You could give money that would help connect athletes made perhaps to uh, mental health resources outside of the university, uh, perhaps. Or uh, maybe you're donating money to get better equipment for uh, the wrestling team if their mats are getting shoddy, whatever that may be. Um, I think the, the one thing that pops out to me there is marketing programs. So if you, if you can donate money to the Tiger Fund for marketing programs, and that, what does that mean? I don't really know, but what I kind of think it means is that money is going to go directly to helping a connect athletes with other opportunities? And what are those? What are those opportunities? Where does that? How does that money connect them? How does that money circle back around? Very unknown, very kind of dark and shady. But it's not that shady because it's legal. It's on the books. Um, yep. The NCAA sort of can't really do anything, but we don't know if they can. But we don't know. But it's because they'd have to fight the state. It, it allows. Uh, it allows um, the the state to sue the NCA if they try to come in and mess with our, mess with our stuff. Um, so it, it, it's, 
it's good. Uh, the one thing I would say, $12 million to this is good. It will help to co- it will help the football team. It will help the football athletes. How does it help them? Well, I don't know. Well, it, it'll help them. It'll help yeah. them. Goodness. Yeah. It'll be good. And it will help get other other football yeah. players uh, to come here and get more of that goodness because we have lots of goodness to help them with. Yeah. It was peddling goodness. That's what the Missouri Athletic Department does. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, you know, there's there's a chip peddler who currently plays for the football team. I know there's a couple of guys who are uh, we're on a frozen pizza for a little bit. Uh, I know the track team has got some ice cream out there, like you know, just marketing for the school. Just you know, we got some some really uh, strapping models, like you said, that are going to be on the face of our marketing campaign, and they're going to be compensated for the labor that they did. Uh, and, and promoting the school via these uh, these different vehicles. So, yeah, it, it's nebulous. I don't I don't want people to think it's shady. I know you didn't mean it that way, but like, it's on the books for the reason. Curtis Gregory pushed this through Congress for a reason. Uh, Eli Drinkwitz worked with him for a reason, so we can do all this stuff. Um, and you know, this kind of goes goes right along with um, Tennessee and Virginia uh, suing the NCAA, citing. Uh, you know, uh, trying to, to to strangle commerce, uh, you know, which, you know, that's the baller move. I, I always wondered if anyone was going to do that. And lo and behold, they did it. Um, and the judge apparently today said that based off of the facts that he saw, uh, the, the NCAA doesn't have a case. Now, he's citing um, some sources where NIL didn't exist. And, of course, NIL does exist. So I'm not exactly sure if the judge is fully aware uh, of everything at this point. It was just kind of a one off comment. Uh, when he first got the docket, but there's a lot of momentum here. Dartmouth is now going to be potentially a, a union of the Dartmouth basketball players. Uh, a judge said that they are employees of the university, so they can unionize. And there's a lot of stuff coming down, uh, let alone the $62 million that just uh, filled up in Missouri's pocket. So I don't know what any of this means going forward. What I do mean, know is that Missouri is going to spend that money. And I know that for the sake of internet debate and clicks and of course rock M slack activity everyone's asking what would you spend 62 million dollars on if you were desiree reed francois and there are plenty of answers there are people who want to tear down herns and build something new there's people who have been still claiming to turf the the baseball stadium for you know 25 30 years at this point that's my choice (laughs) yeah which i don't think costs 62 million but you know it's got to cost something it costs um, one. It costs one million. It costs one. Million. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no, there's no, there's no room. I'm sorry. You know, only so much to go around. Baseball, uh, the number two sport in the SEC. Sorry, just deal with it. Um, so I, you know, I don't know if you th- thought a lot about this, but if you had to divvy up the 62 million, uh, other than baseball and their stadium, what would you spend it on? Uh, I mean, it, it's got to start and stop with football in whatever, in, in that, whatever success football has drives the success of the rest of the programs. I mean, yes, I, as a, as one of the few in the proud Mizzou baseball uh, fanatics, um, I would love some more support uh, to be tossed their way. Um, especially given the fact that every other team in the SEC, including Texas and Oklahoma, it is their second or third sport uh, and it's our eighth or ninth, um, apparently, uh, but notwithstanding, uh, if, if it needs to go to football um, and it needs to, uh, I mean, we could talk about facilities. We spent tons of money on facilities, practice facilities, weightlifting facilities. All those are already updated. $50 million isn't, there's not much more we can do to make those better right now. Now, 10 years from now, are they going to be outdated? Sure. We'll get the next $50 million. I'm sure whoever happily gave this has, has more line in the couch cushions that they can, they can shake up in 10 years. Um, is it best spent? renovating the north end zone. I mean, there's some things that can and need to be done. Uh, this, as, a, as a person who stands every game and watches from the north end zone, the sound system is horrific. So I know they were already planning on getting that fixed, but I, my vo- I lose my voice every time I go to the game, not because I'm yelling, because I, I used to do that. I don't, I don't yell much at games anymore, uh, uh, but I yell, I lose it just from simply talking to my buddy who's standing one foot away from me I'm trying to have a conversation because the sound is, has to be so blasted loud because it's coming from one spot and they have to shoot it out to the whole stadium 
It sounds horrible. It sounds horrible no matter where you are in the stadium. Um, so that needs to be fixed. I, I, I know that's on there. That's on the docket to fix that. That doesn't cost $50 million. Uh, and a new, a new, a new scoreboard that doesn't cost $50 million. Uh, do we need more seats? No. Do we need to do something with the rock M? No, it's awesome. They shouldn't touch it. Um, the rock M is what you should do. Make it bigger. That would, Hey, let, let's make it 3d. Can we like oh, project man. it out or something <laughs> or yeah. some kind of light, maybe a light show, a light show at night where the lights come down oh, and yeah. it projects the M out onto the field. Uh, now that would be, uh, that would be pretty sick, but or fire. We do lots of, we love, we love shooting off fire, fire at, at Mizzou yeah. athletics. Can we yeah. shoot fire out of the rock M uh, <laughs> that could cause, that could be a few bucks to throw, to throw yeah. at him too. Um, yeah. uh, March Mizzou, you know, let's get some new 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 uh, instruments for Marching Mizzou. Uh, full ride scholarships to Marching Mizzou, we'll look out for you. We'll, we'll drop some <laughs> full ride scholarships. Oh man, yeah. Um, Joe Major should yeah. be full ride. That's what I say. I've always said that. <clears throat> right. Um, there are they going to do way more to the North End Zone than they really need to? Yes. Is that fine? Yes. I mean, they've got the money. They have to spend it. They have to do what they what the donor wants them to do with it. Um, do we need to have like a business district down there with restaurants and bars? No, would that be kind of cool? Yeah. Would anyone go there? Probably not. Uh, It it, it would be, I mean, it would be cool to have. I just, you know, is it something that would really benefit the whole athletic department? Probably not. Um, we could tear down Hearns, but I I will tell you, I've talked directly with, uh, um, uh, someone in the athletic department that told me it would cost at least $100 million to tear, just to tear down her. $100 $100 million just to tear. That's not to build Why? something new because it is riddled with asbestos. And we're not talking about a little bit of asbestos. Uh, we're talking about a Hearn center size of asbestos. On top of that, um, it is, it is the uh, federal federally marked down fallout shelter for Columbia. With, if the nuclear reactor were ever to go down uh, sure. because there's so much concrete built there. We're talking like, tens and tens of feet of concrete yeah. to build that thing. Cause when in the seventies, they didn't have the same, I guess, concrete technology that we have now. Um, so it's nothing but concrete and asbestos. Um, and it would, it would the the remediation process and just simply blasting all that out would be so outrageously expensive. Who wants to give a hundred million dollars just to tear something down? That's not even to replace it. So um, I, I don't know. I don't know what the, what the answer is there, but they could, they could certainly refit it. And like it look way different, I would think, yeah. with fifty million dollars, uh, yeah. or we'll, we'll cut it down. We've we've already given Marching Mizzou full rides, and we've got lasers shooting out of the Rock M. So thirty million dollars we can we can we can give to the to the herds. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't. I there's a lot of people with strong opinions on how where this money should go, and I'm I'm not one of them. Um, I think most things are good. I, I I'm curious, you know why this person had such a thing with the north, the north end zone um i i for a long time you know i've, I've been a strong proponent of like enclosing Perot because you got you know you had the opening in the south and then the north and then they kind of closed it off in the south and they built it up back there which is all good and now you have the north that's like you know it's open so maybe that's a very fun way but like if you want to create an environment you want to create kind of like keep that noise in there so you don't have to blast the video board and, 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 and make your voice go bye-bye, like, and close the thing, you know, Oregon and Washington, their stadiums aren't the biggest, but they're consistently one of the loudest because they built straight up, they created walls. And so it creates this very tense atmosphere, this, this very uh, loud atmosphere. Modern stadiums kind of tend to like make it a bowl, kind of make move it out. Think of what, you know, uh, the zoo arena looks like, or if you even go back to like, you know, USC stadium, even though the, that was built older, like, it's it's a bowl. Michigan gets this all the time. Notre Dame gets this all the time. It's like the quietest hundred thousand people in the world because it's just very open. If you enclose it, you can make it louder. Uh, I don't know how you would do that. I'm not an architect or anything like that. But keep the rock in and close the north end zone. Do something fun like that. That's you know, if you want to do that, I think that's cool. Um, I'm with you. It's everything starts with football. If you have a successful football program, all of a sudden you have the money to do everything else that you want. Um, I would give two million dollars to Mizzou baseball. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll double it for them. You know, do something there. I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, I don't particularly care about the Mizzou baseball team, but you care about it, and you and I have gone to games before, so why not? Let's let's have a good baseball team. The thing that always comes back to me is that it is surprisingly 
affordable based off of people that I know uh, and trust uh, on the reporting this stuff. It's surprisingly affordable for um, a college team to bankroll a football team. And we're talking like two to three million dollars a year, roughly. So you have sixty two million dollars. Would you like to bankroll the best uh, football roster for the next 20 years? I, I'd sign up with that. Um, you know, some of that goes to the staff, some of that goes to the players. Sure. Um, and obviously you wouldn't tell any, any recruit about that. Cause then they're going to be asking, you know, like, Oh, well my asking price is, you know, 3 million or something. Like, okay. Jeez, whatever. Um, but I, I would do that. I would, I would put enough in there where you could have three to 4 million a year, really for five or six years and put out, you know, really good teams that you can afford to acquire via, via NIL, um, and just acquire talent in the football and then take everything else. And divvy it up where it needs to go. Uh, if wrestling needs new mats, go and do that. If you want to, I don't know, uh, put a glass dome over the nuclear reactor. I don't know. Knock yourself out. I don't care. But, like, it starts with football. If you have a successful football team, you have a successful athletic department. Um, ask Alabama. They're doing just great in every, every single sport that they have because their football team's awesome. So that would be the big earmark for me. Uh, just fund. Uh, I have enough money to put out a team that is as uh, uh, and wealthy in money as like an Ohio State and Alabama, a Michigan and Texas, what have you. Um, and they're really just figured out from there. And unfortunately, I don't have that money to throw around, but uh, Hurst, I, I think you can cut a check or two to make that happen, right? Well, they, he, he upstaged me. I was going to give 25 mil, and now I've got to wait just so I get my own recognition for it because now it just looks like chump change. Um <laughs> But but you're right. In, in supporting supporting a top level team for even just four years, having that top level elite success for four years, that's going to make money to keep that ball rolling. You're going to have more more big money donors that that see the see the bang for their buck, and they're going to want to get in on it too. Um, and then and it and the money that you're making that the program is making outside of NIL is going to support the rest of the the AD as well. So I. Mean, I that that's I if if you could take sixty two billion dollars and put it into the NIL fund, I would have done that. I mean, that would have been the one what they do because yeah. then I mean then you're you're paying you're paying the best roster for fifty years, uh, and then you're not even having to bring any, any other money in because you're you're a golden ore until they they force Mizzou to move to the NFL. Yeah, and who's to say that's not what happened? Then so, then we'd be then we'd be able to just pay them directly up. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you again, anonymous donor, who I'm sure listens to rock and radio, was listening to this show. Thank you for your donation. I know you listen. If you want to send dollars our way, that's fine. We can do that too. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a good investment, and everyone's very excited, and I can't wait to see what happens. Um, but you know what? Man, we've got over an hour. There's a lot of good things. Talk defense, talk seniors, talk money. I mean... That's a complete show. Nathan Hurst, any parting shots before we get the heck out of here? I just ready to see when spring practice is going to start. It doesn't even need to start. I just want to know when when it's going to start so I can start thinking about when it's going to start. But maybe I don't really even have any words on that yet. So um, I, that might be the next news that we hear. Is, is this, I think it was about this time last year that Drinkwitz announced that. So maybe maybe when we're, we're back together again, we'll uh, actually get to start talking about uh, new ball on the field. Uh, or at least when new ball on the field is going to happen, because that's what I'm excited about. Yeah, and I need uh, I need Mizzou to put up an updated roster online. I'm getting itchy. I need to update my spreadsheet. So please do that, and hopefully we'll hit up here about a spring game, and we'll talk all about that too next time. But that's the show for today. As always, we appreciate the downloads and the subscriptions. You can leave a comment or rate us. We love all types of feedback from you all. You can follow us on X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it. I'm at Nate G. Edwards. He's at First to Hearst. Of course, you can follow the Rock M flagship at Rock M Nation and our podcasting outlet at Rock M Radio. We appreciate you tuning in this time. We'll try to do better next time. And until then, M I Z Z O U. Thank you, everyone, for tuning into Rock M Radio, a proud partner of Fans First Sports Network. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to see more, just like it beamed directly into your personal device. Just click the subscribe button below. Beep. Uh, and you can find this podcast through the Apple Podcast app or for iPhone or the Google Podcast app for Android or whatever app you use to listen to your podcast. Uh, we are also available on Spotify. Just search for Rock M Radio. 
Uh, and if you like other sports, Fans First Sports Network uh, is a podcast network that has uh, coverage of all other teams, Major League Baseball, uh, MLS, uh, NFL, whatever you want uh, to listen and, and read about. It is a great, great network full of really fantastic podcasts. So look them up and subscribe uh, to any and all of those podcasts. Uh, Rock M Radio will be back with more episodes coming soon. Thanks.